Welcome to the CAA 2023 webinar series. Today's webinar is using real-time data to improve pre-hospital care efficiency and patient outcomes, presented by Professor Richard Lyon and proudly supported by Philips. Thanks for joining us and please enjoy. Hi, I'm David Waters, the Chief Executive of the Council of Ambulance Authorities, representing our Australian, New Zealand and PNG Emergency Ambulance Services. Welcome to the latest in our webinar series. Today, we will look at using real-time data to improve pre-hospital care efficiency and patient outcomes. Our sponsor for this webinar is Philips. Our presentation today is provided by Professor Richard Lyon from the UK. Whilst emergency medical services around the globe continue to come under extreme pressure, the demand for improving the efficiency and health economics of pre-hospital care has never been greater. It is also imperative that we continue to deliver the highest possible pre-hospital medical care, particularly to our critically injured or unwell patients. Professor Lyon will discuss how the routine use and transmission of live patient data can improve not only health system efficiency and economy, but also directly contribute to saving lives. Professor Richard Lyon is an active consultant in emergency medicine and pre-hospital care in the UK. Professor Lyon holds a personal chair of pre-hospital emergency care at the University of Surrey and has been honoured by Her Majesty the late Queen Elizabeth for his services to emergency healthcare. Professor Lyon is currently the Associate Medical Director of Air Ambulance Kent, Surrey and Sussex and is clinical lead for Edinburgh Medic One. He is a member of the UK International Search and Rescue Team and was deployed to Nepal following the major earthquake there recently. He also has previous experience in the British Army and has been extensive research portfolio focused on resuscitation, trauma and pre-hospital care. As Richard is based in the UK, he is unable to join us for the live Q&A session that we normally hold at the end of our webinars. But I'm sure Richard's presentation will generate many questions. So please pop these into the chat function and I will follow up with Richard and add his, add his responses to the saved webinar. So please join me in welcoming Professor Richard Lyon. Welcome, Richard. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this CAA webinar. My name is Richard. I'm an emergency physician from the UK. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to join you wherever you may be listening. I wanted to extend a great shout out to my colleagues in Australia and New Zealand. I know everyone the world over actually has been under quite a lot of pressure in ambulance services uh, recently. So big shout out to you. Keep up the great work. And in this session, I'm going to share some experience about sharing live pre-hospital physiological data. And in particular, showing how I think in these really challenging times that we're all facing, uh, it can actually be quite useful for our patients. So I work in the UK. I have the great privilege of being the deputy medical director of one of the air ambulance services in the south of the country. I split my time between working in an emergency department and flying on our trauma helicopter. And this is where I'm going to share some of our experience, not exclusively around pre-hospital data. And just to sort of orientate yourselves, uh, we fly out of a couple of bases in the southeast of England, just to the south of London, pretty large area, actually. Uh, we fly 24-7, mainly to trauma missions, and we're pretty busy. We go to about two and a half uh, thousand patients uh, every year. And uh, last year was actually our, our busiest year on record, as I'm sure all of you are experiencing wherever you may be. There seems to be this huge demand for, for ambulance and pre-hospital care as we come out of the, the COVID pandemic. Now, the majority of what we do on the aircraft is actually deliver critical care on the roadside. I like to think of it as bringing the emergency department to the patient. Believe it or not, there is a patient in the middle of this vehicle wreck. One of these few situations where the patient is, is almost certainly not going to survive if you just put them in an ambulance and drive to the hospital. They need some quite advanced interventions on the side of the road if they're, if they're going to be kept alive. So actually using data in critically pressured 
highly charged situations like this is, is not without challenge. And it's really important that we engage with our technology partners who are making these devices that we use for monitoring our patients and actually engage with them so that they, they learn the challenges we're facing. Um, we engage very closely with Philips and we use the Tempest Monitor and I'm, I'm going to tell you about our experience with that over the course of the presentation. And I thought what would be useful is actually to follow a, a real life case example through so that we're not talking about pie in the sky stuff, we're talking about you know a real patient with, with real injuries and real problems. And this is, uh, this is a live scene of uh, the aircraft or a mission I was on and a young lad uh, called Harry had actually ran out across this road after his football. Unfortunately, he hadn't noticed. A car was coming quite quickly and the car was unable to stop in time and, and knocked Harry down in the middle of this road. And Harry was critically injured, particularly from a head injury point of view. And this is our first pit stop where we think about data. We all want to deliver the best possible clinical care to our patients. And that cannot be any more true than when we're dealing with a critically injured child like, like Harry, or any critically injured patient or unwell for that matter. Now in Harry's case, he had a really significant head injury. Um, this is clearly a simulation, it's not, not a real picture. But this is exactly what Harry was like. He was unconscious, he wasn't breathing very well. And he needed very quick, critical, advanced care. Now, technology is changing all around us. And one of the things I know that is well used across Australasia in particular is GoodSAM. And we've actually been doing a trial, not with the GoodSAM cardiac arrest platform, but actually another function of GoodSAM, which allows live video streaming from the scene. And we've actually just completed the data collection for a randomized clinical trial of seeing whether streaming a live video from the mobile phone of the emergency caller is going to help us improve our tasking to these patients. Now, why I make relevance to this is actually in some of the next generation video streaming, we can actually also stream live physiological data that is interpreted through the video just by blowing up the pixels on the video you can actually determine a patient's respiratory rate pulse rate oxygen saturation for example so i think it's really important that we see what technology is here now but also what's coming around the corner now in harry's case the aircraft was tasked we picked up very quickly that he was critically unwell and uh, he was unconscious and that's exactly the type of mission a hems team is useful for because undoubtedly Harry was going to need an anesthetic at the roadside. Now, when we get to a patient like Harry, one of the first things that any emergency pre-hospital responder will do is attach them to some form of monitoring. And this is crucially important. So in Harry's case, the numbers might look like this. You can easily you know, stand out, see that he's tachycardic, his blood pressure is low, his oxygen level is not ideal. Now, Physiology is going to inform how we handle any of our patients, whether they're medically unwell from stroke or sepsis or an MI, to those injured patients who might be bleeding or having a head injury. A lot of our clinical decision making is directly related to what we see on the monitor. So the first thing, just to state the obvious, is that physiology is really important and getting accurate physiology is really important. But if it's so important, it's probably useful that not just the attending crew start to look at it. And we're going to come back to that shortly, because if it's that important, probably more than one or two people need to see it and they need to see it in real time. Now, in Harry's case, uh, he did have an anesthetics. One of the advanced procedures a HEMS team can bring to the scene is to put a patient into a medically induced coma to protect their airway, make sure they're well oxygenated, control their CO2, which is vitally important for a brain injured patient like Harry. And this is the team performing an anesthetic on the side of the road. Exactly the same level of patient safety is needed if you're performing an anesthetic on the roadside than if you're performing it, for example, 
in an intensive care unit or emergency department. And this is how we set up for our anesthetics. So we have pre-drawn syringes full of the anesthetic medication. And you can see here our Tempest monitor is absolutely central um, to the procedure. So literally in the middle of what we call the kit dump area, so where we're setting up the anesthetic. Now this is important for several reasons. Firstly, we need to be able to see the physiology as we've talked about, but that physiology can change very, very quickly, particularly when you're giving someone an anesthetic. We need to know immediately if there's any change in their oxygen level or their blood pressure changes, for example. The other thing that's really important, which I think we underutilize, is actually time stamping. So time stamping particular points on a patient's journey when key interventions have happened. Now this be, could be, for example, when a ROSC is achieved following a cardiac arrest. In this case, uh, when we give rocuronium, which is our paralytic agent. Maybe when you give adrenaline or another presser, maybe when you give fluids. All of these things we tend to not actually unless we timestamp them directly onto the monitor, really accurately record in terms of time and when they were given. Very often we get to the hospital and we sort of summarize it and we kind of guess a little bit as to when those times happen. But if we want to be accurate with our patient reporting, which is important for the hospital teams, it's also important for audit and research and development, also as we're going to talk about, it's really important we get the time stamping right. So as we treat a patient like Harry, even in this critically charged situation where we've got to be very, very careful when we're anesthetizing a child, we're still taking great care to make sure our data collection is really accurate. Now, what we've done on KSSMs is actually really take this to the new level. What I like to think about the Tempest is our airborne data station. So the Tempest is equipped with several SIM cards which allows the Tempest connect to the cellular telephone network. And actually we have pretty good coverage, even when we're buzzing around at a, a thousand feet, we manage to get you know, good connectivity. So what this allows us to do is literally connect the helicopter or the ambulance that we're traveling in to the cellular network. And that then can connect to our internal patient reporting system. Ours is called HEMSBASE. I'm sure you'll be very familiar with the system you use. Obviously, there's, there's lots of different ones all over the world. But what we can then do is very easily suck in all of that physiological data, literally line by line, minute by minute. So you can see here, we've got our heart rates, our blood pressures. There's the rock uranium that's been marked. And that just sucks seamlessly into the patient record. And what that means is, when we couple it with the interventions that we were, we've given, which you can see here are really accurate, especially all the drugs and the exact minute they were given, we start to form a really accurate picture of what has happened to Harry in the pre-hospital phase. None of it's guesswork. It's all been done in real time with time stamping and being marked. It's also really important for subsequent data review and what having good physiological data means is that you can very easily translate it into a graphic representation. So we'll come back to this, but you really want to be able to look at that whole pre-hospital phase and say, well, what, what did happen to my patient? What was their oxygen level? What was their blood pressure doing? And, and this dip, for example, is, is, is pretty significant. So when we get to hospital, all we need to do is add a bit of written information about what we've done to that patient. And all of this is then filling our patient record form and in our system it auto generates a patient reporting form that we can actually just push one button and email to the trauma coordinator so this is making the system very very efficient it's making us able to give the hospital all the information they need in as accurate as possible manner as we possibly can but crucially very quickly without wasting too much time so harry was taken directly to a major trauma center. We land on the roof of the hospital. And actually the moment we land, we really want to be freeing ourselves up as quickly as we possibly can in case another patient is waiting. Now that's because we're you know, a single crew that has to cover a huge area of England. But this concept of ambulance turnaround is really, really topical. And all of you I'm sure will have experience recently of having to wait to offload a patient in the hospital 
maybe even having to wait for multiple hours in a queue outside an emergency department. So everything we can do to improve efficiency on that process and make the hospital's life easier is a good thing because it's going to help us what we call green up and get out there to our next patient. So if we can have a system that allows us to automatically dump data into an electronic patient record form that can automatically either be electronically sent into the hospital or just printed off and given to them is going to free us up much, much quicker. So I think hospital turnaround and the interface between using data is really important. And we're going to touch on that again towards the end of the presentation. The next area where I think data is really important is to support our clinical governance. Clinical governance is vital to ensure that we're giving the best possible care to our patients all the time, and also to ensure that our patient safety is of the highest standards. This couldn't be any more true for a patient like Harry when we're administering a pre-hospital anesthetic. So you can see here a drop in saturation to 70% on this example case. So we need to know what, what happened there. Was that in the middle of an anesthetic, which would not be ideal? Was it because the monitor fell off or there was poor perfusion? But without recording this data on a minute by minute level, you would never, you would never get to see that. You probably might even miss it if you were look, looking at it live, if it happened very quickly. So all of our cases are subject to very rigorous case review and physiology is important to review because it's the physiology that will determine whether the patient got fluid, got drugs, got an anesthetic. So you've got to have an accurate physiology to review it. This is a case that I came across right recently in the emergency department. This is a patient that has had, as you can see, a needle chest decompression for a suspected pneumothorax. Now, this patient got very, very lucky. Unfortunately, the needle was placed not quite in the right place. Um, needle chest decompression is very rare. I'm sure many of you have never yet had to do it, but you're trained to do it. And the first time you do it might be the only time you've done it. And in this case, the needle had gone a little bit too far in and was actually abutting against the patient's aorta. Now, no, no harm came to this patient. Um, it actually didn't pierce anything and, and all was well. But the point is, if you're going to do a critical intervention, you really want to know that actually it was justified. Was the patient actually having attention? Were they tachycardic, dropping the sats and blood pressure? Or was this just an isolated pneumothorax that could have waited? That's a really important question to determine whether a risky procedure should be performed. So anytime advanced interventions are being performed, I think it's really important we review them, make sure we're doing them correctly, and also asking ourselves if they were justified at the time. And physiology is really important to review as part of that process. Cardiac arrest, for example, this is an example um, diagram of CPR resuscitation quality in a 70 year old that was attended by three paramedics. What it's essentially showing is a minute by minute account with each red bar being a compression, the compression rate. And it's showing not ideal compression quality. There's lots of gaps in the hands on the chest. There's a compression rate, it's really a bit too quick. So anytime we attempt resuscitation, again, it's vitally important we know we're doing the best job and we can feed back to improve to do better next time. And when we did a large study of this in, in Scotland, we found a hugely positive impact just by introducing feedback into ambulance resuscitation. So before we started feeding back to our paramedic crews, they were off the chest a bit too long, taking a bit too long to shock. And all we did was start recording the quality of the resuscitation that many of our monitors automatically do and just sending a nice letter back to the crew saying, hey guys, nice job, but this is how you could do better. And we found a huge improvement in the quality of our resuscitation. And where this can be particularly powerful is if you have lots and lots of monitors, all sending in quality data to one central point. So when I started doing this work, I literally ran around with the USB cable trying to download resuscitation data from every monitor I could get my hands on after cardiac arrest. It's obviously not going to work, particularly over large geographical areas like Australasia. But because monitors are 
now connected, the Tempest is connected multiple fold to the cellular network. You can beam in not just physiology, physiology data, but also resuscitation quality data, for example, that can be held in an ambulance computer, someone can review it, and then it can be fed back to those crews, uh, which is really important for them to allow them to, to improve. And this is exactly what we did um, in the southeast of Scotland. We wired up all our monitors. Every cardiac arrest was automatically beamed in, save me running around with my laptop and USB cable. And we found a huge improvement in our ROS grade. This was uh, the ROS grade by region of Scotland, as you can see, standing out um, above the rest once we introduced this system. So very easily done, um, but with a hugely positive effect. And when we talk about quality, there's so many areas that we can think about, cardiac arrest being one. Trauma is obviously very close to my heart and what we do. So little things, all code red patients. So that's a patient that's bleeding out. We know that tranexamic acid is a good thing. All patients who we think are bleeding out should have tranexamic acid, ideally within an hour of injury. So you can see here, just again, by marking on your monitor when TXA was given and the time, we can just look at our KPIs and have a month by month breakdown and say, hey, how are we doing? And in those months that you know we're not doing so well, we can have a big push and say, come on guys, we've got to, we've got to get our KPI performance a bit better. So clinical governance, patient safety, really important to get high quality data and transmitting is gonna be helpful. What about research and development? Well, if we go back to Harry, and look at these numbers again. He's got a very high heart rate. He's got a very low blood pressure. You'd probably think, well, he's bleeding. And you might well be right. He has been hit by a car after all. But actually, he might not be bleeding. And we've shown as an example that when you have a bad head injury, you can actually get quite deranged physiology. You can get physiology that looks like this. So in a patient who has an isolated traumatic brain injury with nothing else, with no bleeding, just a bad brain injury, over half of those patients will actually um, have significant derangement of their, of their heart rate and their blood pressure. To break it down a little bit further, one in 10 will have a heart rate of more than 100, this is in an adult, and a blood pressure of less than 100 systolic. So if you saw a patient who'd been hit by a car who is tachycardic over 100 and is systolic of less than 100, you'd think they're bleeding. But actually one in 10 of those will just have a brain injury. And of course, it's only by having good physiological data that we can even think about doing studies like this without accurate blood pressure readings. We'd never be able to. In our service, we really informed, I think, globally how pre-hospital anesthesia was performed. Many years ago, the, the default was to use Atomidate and Succimethonium, a very simple combination, pretty safe combination. But what the top graph shows is when we did that, many patients had this big surge in their blood pressure. Really not great for a patient like Harry to have a big surge in his intracranial pressure when he's already got a traumatic brain injury. So we adopted a new, a new cocktail, introducing an opiate, some fentanyl, switching to ketamine and switching to uranium. And many of the hem services around the world now, now use this model. And you can see it gives a much tighter control of your blood pressure, having had the anesthetic. Again, without good physiology and recording every single line of every anesthetic, we'd never be able to undertake work like this. So if you're working in an ambulance service that is keen on research and keen on audit, it's really important that you look at ways to capture physiological data, store it centrally, and allow those researchers access it so they, they can undertake um, studies like this. So we've talked about good clinical care and governance and research. Where are things at now? What's the sort of, I guess, front line of technology? So this moves us on to live data streaming, really quite exciting. So many of you will be familiar with sending what I call snapshot data. So snapshot data involves 12 DTGs, really great example of one packet of data captured on your patient, beamed from the ambulance that you want to send to the hospital because 
you might be having a STEMI and you want to alert the cath lab, for example. That's pretty, pretty familiar. What we did with um, RDT Phillips, and actually generally supported by the European Space Agency, was in to introduce a system called IntelliSpace Corsium. Now, what IntelliSpace allows us to do is stream that data almost in real time. There's just a few seconds delay from a Tempest monitor out there in the field somewhere to essentially anywhere we like because uh, we're sending it to a web server. So why is this useful? Why, why might you want to think about it? Same concept, we can send the snapshot data to the hospital, but we can also send a literally live screen of Harry and his physiology to the hospital if we wanted to. We can also send it to other places. Now, this is really useful to give you some examples. So if you're live streaming from a cardiac arrest patient, we, for a good while, can take patients into London for consideration of ECMO. So you've got a patient in cardiac arrest, they're on mechanical CPR, and you're taking them for potentially going on a heart-lung bypass machine. You know, it's going to be up to the ECMO team as to whether they're going to do that. So then being able to follow the patient in real time, see them coming towards you and look at parameters, for example, like their entidal carbon dioxide, will allow them to make a much more informed decision about how viable this patient is, uh, whether ECMO is likely to be successful. Major trauma, you might see the patient is deteriorating en route. The receiving trauma team can clearly see a patient's blood pressure dropping, for example. That means they can get blood products ready. They might get the surgeon ready. They might clear the operating theater. Sepsis, stroke, pediatrics, all the same. It allows the receiving hospital team with the respective experts to gain much better situational awareness of the patient before they even arrive. It's as if they've been following the patient through. And all of the parameters that we see on the screen can then be amalgamated into a new score. And we're going to come back to that. I think it's really important that we, that we um, have a new score displayed. So we're doing this on a regular basis now. When we have a critically unwell patient like Harry, we can literally flick a switch and the monitor goes on in the hospital and the hospital team can see exactly what we're seeing. So beaming the data to the hospital. What about remote support? Many of your ambulance services will have some form of uh, top cover that you can call for difficult cases. Now, in our service, any pediatric anesthetic like Harry, for example, should absolutely trigger uh, top cover support, ringing a consultant to discuss the case and say, right, should we or shouldn't we not anesthetize this child? This is how I would do my top cover. I would receive a phone call from the crew on the side of the road. I would often be looking at the map to see where they are, bring up our PRF to, to get some patient details or see what time the, uh, the call originated from, et cetera. But of course, I'm reliant on that crew literally taking time on the phone to say the pulse was this, the blood pressure is this, and you get, you get one quick little view. And it, it can take up a lot of time on the phone call when I'd rather be discussing other things like you know, what we should do in terms of clinical care. So having introduced IntelliSpace Corsium, it's very straightforward. The minute the monitor goes on, well, I can just log on and see exactly what that crew is seeing um, on the side of the road. And I might be sitting in Scotland and they might be down in Surrey. It doesn't really matter where I am. I can also view it on my phone, so I don't even need to be tied to a computer. And it, it, quite straightforwardly, I, I can see exactly what the crew is seeing. Now, on KSS, we have been using video for quite a long time. One of our new products around the corner is to actually convert the video badges that our crews wear into live streaming video badges. So not only would I be able to see the physiology, but I could potentially you know, see the mechanism of injury. So in this case, this is the damage your head does if you're struck by a car, clearly very significant. I can then immediately switch and say, right, this is our patient. Actually, this patient, just one glance, looks pretty stable. You know, the heart rate's normal, blood pressure's normal. I get a very immediate impression of to what physiology is doing and without needing to take up lots of time on the telephone. I can also, crucially importantly, 
look at the trends. So it's not just what's my patient doing now, but what direction are they going in? Where were they five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, half an hour ago? Good example, I received a call last week saying, should, should the crew pit stop for some blood? And it's like, well, maybe, but actually it all depends on what the trend is. Is their blood pressure continuing to fall? Is it stable? So just being able to quickly go onto the temper screen and say, right, what, what's the trend? Let's have a look at those will, will really allow me to give much better informed uh, decision support to the crew that's making that call. If the crew are putting in all of these um, interventions accurately, I can see what's already been done, for example. You can couple it to some of your um, specialist interventions like video laryngoscopy. And I think we haven't completely synced up everything, but you can easily imagine the situation where you can be sitting on your computer and actually get all of this information in real time in a one So what's happened? What condition is my patient in now? How are they improving, deteriorating? What interventions need to be done? Can I support the crew with those interventions in real time? Really gives a much better much more informed way of doing remote decision support and i think particularly in australasia where you have you know very remote and rural um, settings and i know some of the telehealth systems set up are all incredibly advanced from a clinic point of view um, this is just taking that technology and literally putting it you know on the on the roadside or um, out onto airside if you want to and then the final step um, is to complete that communication loop. So sometimes, you know, the crew will want to send me some physiological data. I've spoken to them. And, you know, I just want to, in future, be able to push an acknowledge button that flashes up on the temper screen so that the crew know I've, I've seen it, I'm aware, I'm there, I'm with them, but I haven't had to interrupt them by calling them back. It's just that, that closed loop acknowledgement. And we're taking this forward to the next level. So this is the, the back of our aircraft. Um, we fly in Augusta Westland 169 helicopter. And we've configured the cabin in such a way that the patient is really central. And all of these bags are custom made that we do regularly anesthetize patients like Harry on the aircraft on the ground. And what we're hoping to do is take that forward to actually undertake some of these critically important procedures like anesthesia in the air while we fly. So you can see here the Tempest mounted um, centrally in the cabin, and that will stream patient data along with our video data that will allow us to remotely monitor quality assure research, um, make sure that you know this seismic change in practice for us um, is being done in the right way and, and crucially um, safely. So that's um, an introduction to the live streaming. And what struck me over the last few weeks in particular is the immense ambulance pressures that we, we all seem to be under. What's really striking is that if we're having a bad day in London or Surrey, you're probably also having a bad day in Brisbane or Auckland. Um, all of the news seem to be reporting, you know, essentially the same thing huge pressure on our ambulance services and in particular this problem of having to queue outside hospitals so certainly in london it's not uncommon to wait many many hours as i know it's the same in australasia to, to offload your patients now at the moment our our system for managing that particularly from the hospital end is is really not great. In some cases, we employ paramedics or nurses to run up and down these ambulances and say, hey, what have you got? We try and you know bring them in in some sort of order, but very often it's just, you know, who arrived first? And in some extreme cases, even if you're putting in your standby call saying, hey, you know, I've got this critically injured child, you know, hopefully that will get you right to the front of the queue, but there still needs to be space. Now, this is where technology could, could really, really help. We've talked about beaming data to the hospital in isolated cases like trauma and Harry, for example. But if, for example, in this you know, five ambulance example, all of them were just beaming in the data, well, you can kind of glance at these and it's not immediately obvious who the sickest patient is. I, I would struggle probably to say, hey, who's the sickest based on physiology? 
this is where news can be really helpful. So actually, if you saw on your emergency department screen, well, hey, I've got these five ambulances waiting outside. They're all being monitored. Um, I can look at the trends. I can look at their news. I can say, you know what? This patient, although they've just arrived at the back of the queue, is seems to be, you know, pretty sick. And actually, he's on a downward trend. And it looks like, you know, he's old and he's septic. Let's bring him in first rather than bring in the one that arrived in time order first, but really does appear quite stable. And again, we can suck in all of that data from the ambulance, dump it into our patient record. Um, and this is the sort of panacea when you have uh, pre-hospital IT systems talking to hospital systems, which I know is a huge challenge, but actually from an IT point of view, really quite straightforward. And I, I've no doubt it will come. It's just a question of you know when and how, and we just need to work hard on that interface. We'll improve patient care because that sick patient gets in quickly also mean that uh, our, host, our ambulances are freed up much quicker. Um, we, we've done the data, we get them out there. So that can only be a good thing. In good news, Harry actually made an amazing recovery. He actually made a full recovery from a really traumatic brain injury. And no small part, thanks to you know, the interventions that were delivered uh, on, on scene that day. So ladies and gents, just in summary, I think the use of pre-hospital data is, is really important. It, it drives all improvement. You can't improve unless you know where you are now. So measuring whatever you wanna measure in terms of pre-hospital care quality needs to be measured so that you can inform where you're going. Data will drive your improvement. Personally, I think every resuscitation attempt should get a download. You should look at the quality of resuscitation how deep you're pushing, how quickly your chest compressions are going in, your time to shock, and then feed that back to crews so that they can do better the next time. We really want to be striving on a service level to high quality cardiac arrest resuscitation care. If you're going to do a critical intervention, whatever it may be, you need to be able to justify that intervention. And actually, physiology is crucially important to that justification. You need to have a good understanding of your patient's physiology before you do any pre-hospital intervention. Bedding fee physiological intervention timestamping data directly into your ambulance POF will improve the quality of your reporting, improve the quality of care that the patient is going to get into hospital because the hospital team are better informed, and quite frankly, will improve turnaround times because you don't have to spend time at hospital doing it. Streaming data to various teams, whether it's hospital specialty teams, top cover teams, management teams, allows other people to help you when you're out there, help you with your decision making. Share that, share the share the burden of the decision making with people that you know are expert and can help. If you want to power research and development, if you want to innovate, you are going to have to capture good data. And in pre-hospital care physiology is important for that. So think about capturing it centrally so that you can do meaningful work. And overall, I think using data is going to make our teams better. We can see in hindsight what the patient was actually doing. We can look at our interventions. We can review cases. We can have a much better informed picture for patients, not just like Harry, but other cardiac arrest patients, all the patients we see um, and strive for continuous uh, bettering of patient care, particularly in these really challenging times, we mustn't lose sight of that desire to always be better by paying good attention to the basics. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope you find that useful. Uh, take care and keep up the great work.
Right. Uh, Richard, thank you so much for um, taking time to provide the webinar for the Council of Ambulance Authorities. Um, obviously, the topic really, really relevant for us, data in real time, uh, top of mind for lots of us um, and our services. Got a few questions for you from our participants. Firstly, the first comment really is one of our viewers noted where the SPO2 dropped. I think it dropped down to 70% in your presentation. He noted that the data needs to be read in context in context of the patient presentation. The drop in SPO2, for example, may be real or may be the result of the probe dislodging. However, trends seem to be more accurate than individual data points. Just wondered what your thoughts were on that, whether the probe had dislodged. Yeah, and firstly, David, thanks very much for the invitation and delighted to uh, to help the CAA and glad that glad the presentation was received so well and it's certainly very topical um here here as well now that's a that's a brilliant question a very very pertinent question um of course the the viewer is entirely correct that the drop in sats could be artifactual and um, it could be the probes come off it could also be that the you know the finger or the toe or whatever you put the probe is a bit cold and it's not perfusing very well um so that there's a few points to that of course if you're looking at in real time you will also have that information because you will see the quality of the the pleth trace um so if you've got that you know nice good sats pickup you're going to be much more convinced that it, it's a real drop in sats as opposed to if your trace has gone you know flat or a bit bumpy or indeed not there at all so of course you can see that on the live stream and you can see that on a scroll back. Um, when you do that snapshot capture, of course, a little bit more difficult if you don't have that. But we, um, because we're quite hot on this, we encourage our crews to annotate all abnormal um, physiology, pertinent abnormal physiology. So, you know, we talked in the presentation about checking physiology before you do an advanced intervention like a needle decompression or something um and all, we have a, a free text box that you can actually write you know so i i would have expected something like that to say probe off hand okay. cold or something like that qualifying that qualifying that sats so yeah it unfortunately doesn't get away from the fact that you know, sats can be low for lots of reasons including artifact but there are means um, within the data capture to actually to annotate that. So hopefully you're going to know which one it is. Yeah, great. Thank you. And um, one of the other questions for, I guess, the Australian and New Zealand sector is really around IntelliSpace Corsium is a, looks like a great product, but it relies really heavily on the connectivity, particularly between pre-hospital care and uh, ED or the hospital yeah. system. How have you managed to succeed in that space? Because that's one of the areas where we really struggle, not just with connectivity, but you know, with firewalls, cyber security, all those other complications of having a joined up system. Yeah, David, listen, that's definitely not unique to Australia. I think the NHS IT systems are the most uh, headache, lockdown, difficult in the world. They, they, it, it's been a real challenge, if I'm honest. Um, so listen, the way we've got around that at the moment is, is pretty straightforward. When, we, when we've when we launched these project, projects, um, usually on a pilot basis with, with the hospitals, we've actually gone into the hospital and we've installed a, a computer with a big plasma screen that's completely independent of everything else. And in one case, I remember actually we just had to put a little dongle there and actually connect the dongle to the, the local cell network um, because trying to attach this external thing to the hospital network was just proving too much of a hassle from a cybersecurity point of view. Um, I think the fact that um, it's uh, the, the Corsium is a, it's, it's web based, you're just going to a web browser does actually make it um, easier. So more recently, we have um, got around these things because NHS has basically come around to realizing that this stuff is important and it's the future and, and all they need to do is permit a website and actually once they've seen the website they'll do it so actually because you're not having to put software or apps or app or added hardware yeah. on a hospital IT and hospital IT machines that hugely decreases the sort of you know perceived IT threat but you're, you're absolutely right. And the, the person that posed the question is absolutely right. The key to all of this is the interface between the pre-hospital and the hospital and the fact that we still continue to work in these very separate silos um, and little things like who's going to pay for it. You know, 
the yeah. pre-hospital guy might pay for it, but the hospital guy might get all of the benefit. Um, and then, uh, but ultimately, the patient's going to get better caring. So, yeah, it, it's all around having good connections, not <laughs> not just the IT yeah. ones with the hospital, but having a local champion people within the hospital that are really going to fly, fly the flag. And actually, yeah, to get things going, look for the path of least resistance if it's put a laptop in a corner um, and then look to transition to sort of more permanent solutions in a kind of step by step basis as people see the benefit as the view we took. Mm. I guess in the south, southeast of England, you've got good cell phone coverage. Obviously, that's not the case then in rural Australia, rural New Zealand. Any thoughts about that? I mean, one of the things that we've been talking about increasingly so is things like Starlink, so satellite um, connectivity, as opposed to relying on a on a very scarce cellular network. Yeah, 100%. I mean, that would be one that we, we could look at um, together, my colleagues in Philips. I mean, remember, you know, RDT stood for remote diagnostic technologies. Uh, the the mm-hmm. whole origins of the Tempest was actually I mean, insanely cool. Um, it, it was actually invented to transmit patient data down the airwaves of an airliner radio um, so that if you had a chest pain at 30,000 feet and they need to make a decision about whether to divert the plane or not, they could actually beam your 12 lead you know, down through airwaves. So it's, it's designed to be very clever with, with data sending. Now, we have a, a similar problem when we're buzzing along at 1,500 feet in the helicopter towards London. Of course, there are patches where there is no connectivity and the height, although that's not very high, adds to that. So there are dropouts um, and the dropouts, they, they just stop sending and then it will just pick up again when it gets signal. It doesn't need much, it needs a tiny amount, like one bar of edge signal to actually do its thing. So, of course, linking it, you know, via Bluetooth or um, other means to a sat phone or a Starlink, you know, Wi-Fi area is is all absolutely possible. Um, of course, there's cost implications to that, but uh, it, it, in terms of ability to do it, it's all it's all there, and the device is, is very very capable of you know connecting to multimodal connection sources so it would just be a question of looking at your individual service and working out what 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 connections uh, are best yeah another question from our viewer there is no doubt that real-time data is valuable what i would like to know is what structure do you have behind the scenes that supports this is this fully funded um who reviews each case what is the training setup that responds to identified concerns what are the boundaries between yourself, clinicians, and receiving hospitals? It seems like the data gathering is the tip of the iceberg and the easiest part of the process. And they're really referring to the all the activity that happens, I guess, with the data. That's a great question. Obviously, a huge oh, question huge. to answer. Yeah. I, I, I think um, I think suffice to say. The air ambulance community in the UK is very, very advanced in terms of its clinical governance processes. And I think that is what allowed us to do all of this stuff. So what that means is we have um, a team of clinical governance leads. So they're they're senior clinicians that have been working in the service a long time. That we have a culture of case review. So every single case that the air ambulance attends is is reviewed um, initially as a kind of desktop exercise by a senior paramedic and a senior doctor who weren't involved in the case. You know, selection of those go on to sort of like a case review day, a clinical governance day. And then HEMSBASE, which is the the system I talked about, the sort of patient record system that um, you know, we use, it was actually invented by one of our own doctors way back in 2012, I believe. So it, this desire to kind of have data at our fingertips and analyze it, it actually came from within. It was one of our doctors who went out and wrote this program. And because of that, we are very used to everything, data security and data management. And because certainly in our service, we do a lot of research you know, we're also very used to having to deal with large chunks of data, actually share data, even with our Australasian colleagues when we're doing research. So we, we're used to all the complexities of having to securely manage data and how to do that within a governance framework. And the hospital part of that has almost become like a bit of an outreach, you know, just put a, a satellite there. And, and very helpfully, a, a lot of our governance leads work within these hospitals. We have those connections we talked about before. 
but you're right. It, it, you can't just sort of go in and do this willy nilly. You're going to have you're going to have to have um, policies and procedures around your data handling, your data governance, your data security. Who's allowed to see it? Who's not allowed to see it? All this kind of stuff is is really important and uh, clearly a massive talk on it by itself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have. Uh, I guess it's a final question from our audience before we hop into a couple of my own. Um, there was some interest, obviously, in Good Sam. Uh, as you probably know, the majority of Australians, certainly all of New Zealand, have adopted Good Sam now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to join that up. Um, but they were particularly interested in the fact that Good Sam um, can potentially take someone's pulse by measuring uh, flushes in their face with each heartbeat, etc. Just, I guess, wondering where you're progressing with Good Sam, and. Um, and also, I guess, in relation to your um, um, RCT, how that's progressing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks. So I think just for the viewer's benefit, it gives some of those phenomenal system, you know, it's, as you all know, there's there's different elements within GoodSAM. So the, the kind of GoodSAM app responder is one everyone is familiar with, and that's the one that will task you if there's a cardiac arrest closely in your location. The other element of Good Sam, which does not require you to have an app on your phone, is where we, the ambulance control center can actually send a mobile phone a link. You hit the link and all it does is open up your camera that is transmitting within the Good Sam system. Um, and certainly uh, there is the ability to look at pulse rate and heart rate. Um, if you hold your camera, you have to be quite close and quite still for it to work, but it does work. We have been doing an RCT of using essentially live camera streaming from the emergency caller versus normal pick up the phone and ring um, for advanced for, for major trauma cases. That was the see it trial. We've, we've just actually finished data collection, David, for that um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so we're in the with the process of analyzing that data to see what what differences it make. Basically, did it improve our our ability to task and enhanced resources, so critical care paramedics, helicopters, that kind of stuff, to major trauma incidents? Um, and did it improve our accuracy? Because, of course, we don't want to be tasking those resources to you know, minor things. So data capture is complete. I, I don't have any um, results to share as yet because it's ongoing. I, I do know that, of course, there was the anecdotal you know, case studies within that when it's worked ext extremely well. Um, just the ability to see a scene and sort of pan, particularly when you've got more than one casualty, is is really good. We're, we're already planning the next study around that. Uh, it's tricky to say whether we'll sort of stick with the major trauma, really sick patients. A bit of me wonders whether actually the value of live video is for the less acuity, the lower acuity, stay at home, have a teleconsult with a, with a doc whilst you're there. Yep, they're not too bad. We'll arrange follow up this afternoon. Job um, might be in terms of the sort of wider health system more more beneficial. Um, but yeah, watch the space, and as soon as I've got some results, I'll share them. Excellent. Yeah, we're looking forward to seeing those results. Um, obviously, time stamping is a fundamental in achieving real time data. Um, but in the midst of a very busy scene. How, how do you implement the discipline that enables time, time stamping to occur? Yeah, that's a good one. So the first, <laughs> first obvious point is you need to make sure your monitor is correctly time synced. The number of times you know you turn it on and it's on random time, and of course that's totally not helpful and very confusing. So in your morning shift, do you just make sure you, you, the time is correct? We we do have quite good discipline. I think it's probably fueled by the fact you clearly need to make life as easy as possible. So what we do on the Tempest, you know, you push one button and it pops your sort of top 10 list, whether it's going to be adrenaline, fluid, morphine, rock uranium would be, you know, the obvious ones. Yeah. Um, so you need to, you, that list is totally customizable uh, depending on your service and what you're doing day in, day out. Um, it, it really is a sort of two second job to go bing, 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 done. Um, it, it's not, it, it's not, not that big a deal at all. If you have a system that is very user friendly and, and tuned to what you're doing, and and you've got that user discipline, um, and I think we're constantly cross checking each other. So if I see something given, I'll verbalise. Can you stamp it? Can you mark it? And someone does it. Yeah. Um, and and again, in simulation, it's useful when you're when you're doing your 
your know, ELAS resuscitation drills, that kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff you need to build build into drills because um, we're all very good at doing our sort of CPR drills and our intubation drills. But actually, it's the so- the softer skills and the the minutiae that's important, so that when you're training them, that under pressure you're going to remember to timestamp it. But it is it is pretty straightforward. Great, thanks. Um, obviously, uh, you touched on the global challenge of patient offload delays, uh, yeah. patient handover. Um, and patient flow through the system. That's obviously a very, very um, pertinent topic in Australia at the moment and increasingly so in New Zealand. Is it affecting um, your aeromedical service as much as it is obviously the road service? And I'm also really interested um, to know a little bit more about NUS, um, the acronym, and um, and where you are in relation to uh, that patient prioritisation on the ramp. So ambulance offloads. So is it affecting us? I guess yes and no. Knowing that we can fly to the hospital, land on the roof, and take the patient, and it doesn't, and we can jump the queue, obviously. Um, oh. it, it was, lots of times, the hospital can be very, very busy. So obviously, internally, you know, they 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 are under pressure. But generally, I have to say, my hospital colleagues in London are are fantastic at, at giving us the reception we need. Usually, because we're bringing really, really super sick patients. Where it can affect us, though, is like everywhere, just lack of ambulance availability so when we're in situations where you know we have to land a long way from the scene because it's all built up or you know we we can't land at a hospital because it doesn't have a helipad or we need a land transfer there are times when there's just no ambulances available and that can be challenging because then we're stuck with a patient in a helicopter in a field and we can't move them um it's still thankfully rare but it it, it can happen as a result of these offload delays now i think to say we're not the, the whole point of using um uh, live data sort of triage that is not it's not yet being done so it's not being done because of the challenges i alluded to before between the pre-hospital and the hospital interface you conceptually it's entirely possible to do that but no one to my knowledge in the uk is doing it on a regular basis there might be sporadic or oh, let's check his or let's do this but no one is doing what i said in the presentation which you know have a big screen have a whole queue news is news is really really important in my view because when a patient comes into the hospital we actually for about a week moved away from looking at the ambulance physiology we said we're just going to take whatever the ambulance physiology you know the the the, the vital signs as read and just put them on the sheet and we had a couple of disasters actually within that week just because of poor communication and i think the the, the, the OBS weren't taken quite as close to offload as we thought. And actually, because we didn't check them again, the patient was, was sicker. So we've now reverted to taking a set of OBS at the front door, which is very time consuming. It takes a nurse, it takes triage space, all that kind of stuff. So, and I think if you were beaming it in, of course, you get rid of all that. The problem is when you get these OBS, you know, you've got you've got a lot of information to process. You've got a pulse rate, a heart rate, a respiratory rate, an oxygen saturation. And you've got to sort of make a quick decision as to is that patient sicker than that patient, sicker than that patient. And I think that's where news can can really, really help. And because of the offload, by definition, there's time involved. So you need to have some sort of way of analyzing trends. So if the heart rate's going up and the blood pressure static, is that worse than the blood pressure dropping, but the heart rate being static, for example. So that's where you know our national earning warning score, all you do is you know, it does it all for you and it just churns out a number. Um, and the higher the number, the sicker you are. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a very useful metric. But until an ambulance trust partners with a hospital close enough and engaged enough to, to do this on a regular basis, I don't think we'll really be able to evaluate the impact on ambulance offloads until, until someone actually just does it properly and sustainably does it so we can look at the data and see how yeah. effective it is. That's great. And just to finish off, um, I really enjoyed your um, seven points in your summary. I think everyone should print those off and put them on the wall. <laughs> but um, um, but particularly like the um, statement, um, make data your trusted partner. And mm. I think that's um, uh, a great um, basis to go forward on and um, certainly underpins uh, all the work you're doing, Richard. Um, mm. Any final comments from yourself? 
No, no, thank you very much again, David. It's, uh, it's always great to support CEA and uh, keep up the great work you're doing down under. And uh, hopefully I can visit soon and see all your members in person. It would be great. That's awesome. We'd love to see you again, Richard. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And also thanks to Philips for supporting your participation um, in our webinar. We do appreciate that too. Fingers crossed we'll see you later in the year. That would be pretty awesome. No problem. David, great Excellent. to see you again. Great Take to see care. you. Thank you for your time, Richard. Cheers now. No problem. Safe travels home. Yeah. Cheers now. Bye-bye. Thank you for attending using real-time data to improve pre-hospital care efficiency and patient outcomes presented by Professor Richard Lyon and proudly supported by Philips. To keep up to date, including our upcoming webinars, please follow us on social media, Twitter at CAA Australasia, Facebook and LinkedIn, the Council of Ambulance Authorities. Thanks for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time.